If the brain is deprived of its blood supply, it will stop working and the patient will become unconscious within 10 to 20 seconds. And I've seen this in cardiac arrest situations. You can actually, I've actually been in a cubicle with a patient, seen ventricular fibrillation on the monitor, and the patient actually remains conscious for what seems an awful long time, but in actual fact wasn't more than about 20 seconds because the brain will stop working, very sensitive to oxygen lag. And within one to four minutes, brain damage will start to occur. And we normally say that if a cardiac arrest goes on for three minutes, then there is the risk of, of, of brain damage. But don't let that deter you from trying to resuscitate patients. Do still try to resuscitate and don't assume that there is brain damage. This is the, this is the principle behind basic life support. When we do chest compressions, we're generating a, a circulation. When we blow oxygen or even our expired air into someone else's lungs, oxygen is getting into the lungs, that's going into the blood and circulating to the brain. So good basic life support will keep the brain oxygenated while we are waiting for advanced life support to arrive. The myocardium itself is very oxygen dependent. Experimental studies have shown that three to five minutes after losing their oxygen supply, myocardial cells will start, will stop contracting. Three to five minutes after losing their oxygen supply, they will stop contracting. And after that, there will be progressive damage, eventually resulting in cell death. This is why, if we're going to thrombolize patients, that is, if we are going to remove the thrombus from a coronary artery to reperfuse the myocardium after a coronary thrombosis, we should do so as quickly as we can after the initial event. Experimental studies have shown that kidney cells will start to die after about 20 to 30 minutes. So 10, 20 minutes, kidney cells will stop working. After 20 to 30 minutes, kidney cells will, stop, will start dying if they're deprived of their oxygen supply experimentally. Liver cells, as we mentioned, very metabolically active, need a lot of oxygen, and they can start being damaged after about 10 minutes. Skeletal muscle cells, though, can survive in the absence of oxygen for quite long periods of time, two hours. So when we use tourniquets in surgical situations, as we often do, to leave a tourniquet on for half an hour or even an hour is not going to damage the skeletal muscle cells in that limb. An hour and a half is probably the, the longest you'd ever want to leave a tourniquet on for. But it shows that skeletal muscle cells are much more resistant to hypoxia than other tissues. So hypoxia will eventually damage and kill any tissue, but the amount of time it takes for the tissue to stop working and for that tissue damage to occur does vary between tissues quite significantly. To understand hypoxia, we need to understand the physiology of oxygen. And specifically, we need to understand how oxygen goes from this diatomic molecule of oxygen in the air all the way to the mitochondria. And we're going to try and do that diagrammatically. So, the first thing is that there is oxygen molecules in the air. And it's a diatomic molecule, two atoms of oxygen per molecule. So there is oxygen in the air. And the first thing we need to do is we need to get the oxygen down into the airways. So some oxygen will go through the nasal cavities, some will go through the oral cavities, and it will go down the trachea, and that will divide into the right and the left main bronchus. So oxygen in the air, and these airway passages, the upper airway passages, must be patent. So here we have a cross section of the head that shows the upper airways rather nicely. 
So here we've got the uh, cranial cavity here. This little bit here would be the uh, pituitary fossa, where the pituitary gland sits. And these are air-filled sinuses within the bones of the, the skull. Here we have the uh, nostril here going up there. And these are the nasal cavities. And of course it's vital that all of these airways are patent to allow air into the lower airways. If the upper airways are obstructed, the oxygen chain is blocked at that point and there will be hypoxia. So air will go in through the nasal cavities. And this part at the back here is the pharynx. So this is the nasopharynx behind the nose, the oropharynx behind the mouth, and the laryngopharynx is this bit here around about this larynx area, this being the larynx. So here we can see some teeth, the tongue of course, these are the tonsils there, look. Um, so air can go in through the nasal cavities or through the oral cavities, meeting up at the back in the pharynx. And here, this is the larynx, and here we have the start of the trachea. And what's interesting is my pen at the moment is in the line of the esophagus. So the esophagus is immediately posterior to the trachea here, which is anterior, and the larynx, which is anterior to the posterior esophagus. But of course, what this means is that when we eat, the bolus of food has got to get from the mouth here over the top of the glottis, which is the top of the airway. That opening at the top of the airway is called the glottis. And this is a rather nice model because obviously we don't have pieces of string uh, in human beings, but we do have this flap of tough tissue here, which is the epiglottis. The epiglottis covering the whole which is the glottis. And during swallowing, food will go from here, over the back of the tongue, and the epiglottis will shut. And as the epiglottis shuts, that seals the glottis, which of course is the top of the airways. That means the bolus of food can go from the tongue, over the top of the now closed epiglottis, directly into the only space left here, which is the esophagus. So during swallowing, the epiglottis will go down, covering the glottis, which is the top of the airway, and the food will go over the top and into the esophagus. And you can see now why the most common cause of choking, which is food going down into the airway, going down here, is people trying to talk and eat at the same time, because this coordination goes wrong. So don't try to talk and eat at the same time, because you're likely to choke. So the first stage is oxygen in the air. The second stage is patent upper airways. Here we see a diagram of the upper airways. Here we've got the frontal sinus in the frontal bone of the skull, and of course the cranial cavity over here. Another sinus here, and this is the nasal cavity round about here with the nostrils with the air going in just there. This would be the hard palate on top here, along there, which of course is a bony structure. And the oral cavity is the mouth just there. The nasopharynx, this whole bit here of course is the pharynx. The nasopharynx is this top part here, and this would be nasopharynx. Oropharynx is that next bit down here, the back of the mouth. And the laryngopharynx is this bit lower down. Laryngopharynx. Epiglottis, this is the flap of uh, tissue that we looked at, which was rubber in the other model. And of course this flaps down to cover the glottis, which is this area just here. Here's the cartilaginous larynx, the knobbly bit you can feel in the front of your neck, leading onto the main airway, the trachea, and as we see, the esophagus is behind the trachea. This is the esophagus here, 
which is posterior 